God's word tells us to praise even when you're panicked. It tells us to praise even in the dark nights. It tells you to praise even when things aren't going the way you want it to go. Look at this, what God's word says in Psalms chapter 34 verse 1. I will bless the Lord at, I will bless the Lord at, I want you to make this a commitment. I will bless the Lord at, good and his praises shall continually be in my mouth all the time every time in my mouth his praises why because he's worthy of it why because nobody else deserves my praise why because even if a Prius driver cuts you off he doesn't deserve your anger God deserves your praise when things are falling apart Lord thank you How did you know you were supposed to leave India and come to America? Many young people, we're going to be talking about this in a few weeks. How do I know this person is the right person for me to marry? How do I know that this is what I need to invest my money? How do I know this is the neighborhood I got to move into? How do I know this is the time God wants? How do I know I should quit this job and take this job? How do I know these things? Pray! Because prayer reveals the plans of God, the essential things that you need in this life, especially in the battle. Look at how the psalmist writes this. He says, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. You see, man's plans change. Your father's plans might have changed every time he said, we're going to go on a vacation. And then he says, sorry, the boss called me in and I had to, you know, cancel the plans this week. And, and you grew up with this idea that anybody in authority cannot be trusted because they're constantly changing their plans. God is not so. Because you see, God, His plans, nobody can change it. Because the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of His heart to all generations. And then it gets beautiful because in Psalm 32, He shows us how He is so eager to instruct you with His plans. Look at this. Psalm 32 verse 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. Like a GPS that doesn't misdirect you. I will instruct you and I will teach you in the way you should go. And then he says, I will counsel you. How? With my eye upon you. So, so I have to make this connection, right? So when you pray and say, Lord, I do not know what to do, but my eyes are on you. He says, don't worry, my eyes are on you too, my child. And I, 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 I'm guiding you. I will counsel you. I will teach you. Because you see, when you were three years old and four years old and five years old, God didn't tell you what you had to do when you were 35 years old. He had to wait, and just because of the waiting, you thought maybe God doesn't want to counsel me and guide me anymore. And then you believe the lies of the enemy. And you stop praying, you stop going to God. But when you go in prayer, you get the essential thing that you need in life. You need the plans of God for your life. You need the plans of your creator, the one who manufactured you. You need to know what it is he put you on this earth for.
you don't silence your worship because you don't want to offend others. Oh man, I'm just going to silence my worship. I'm just going to silence my anointing. I'm just going to silence my calling because uh, I'm worried about this brother. He's suffering right now and he's going through a lot, right? That's not American. Yeah. He's just going through a lot right now. So I'm just going to keep my worship just mild. It's not the time and place for this. Boast in the Lord so the humble will be excited about who God is. Man, I believe that authentic, genuine praise is one of the best examples of the gospel that can be preached in a world today. Because man is worshipping everything else. And when we worship the true and the living God with spirit and in truth, a dying world has no idea. But they're curious. My soul makes a boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. And then he says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Make him large. Boast. Make him big. Magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. God still is guiding his children. His promises are still yes and amen. And you might be white, you might be black, you might be Republican, you might be Democrat, you might have taken the vaccine or not, and God is still for you and not against you. God loves you and he looks for this one thing. What did you do with my son? Just that. What did you, are you enduring under the blood? Or have you rejected him? Have you heard messages time and time and time and time again in this country where we're free, where we can get up and preach this way and I don't get shot down or killed outside on the street? Have you taken this freedom so, you know, casually? And have you demeaned the Son of God? Or have you embraced him and endured? And has his love, has his forgiveness caused your heart to turn to praise? Good morning. Are you guys ready to worship? Will you stand? Let's worship.
stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Shadows can't deny 
I don't know how many of you guys feel like these are just songs, just words. Victory can seem so, so far away in your life right now. And for the past few weeks, we've been talking about the blessing on the battlefield. And it seems like you see the battle really clearly, but the blessing is nowhere to be found. And I can sense this morning that as we're singing about victory, as we sing about the weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper, it seems like, <laughs> God, maybe that was true for Israel, but is it still true for me today? Okay, I want worship to be true this morning for you. I want the promises of God to be realized this morning. God does not lie. God does not change his mind. So hear the words of God. It says in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man. I'll pause right there, Pastor. That's not a great way to start a passage, right? Cursed is the man. Okay, but follow through. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. While you're going through the thick of the battle, the enemy will want to tempt you to turn off the promises of God and to trust in the flesh, to trust in the strength of man, to trust in monetary things that will fail you. And God's word says you'll be cursed when you trust in those things that will fail you. Cursed is a man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. And this is why, whose heart turns away from the Lord. What happens when you begin to trust in flesh is you turn away from God, the promise-making, promise-keeping God, and you start holding on to the tangible things, the things that you can see today, but are going to be gone tomorrow. Sometimes in worship, we have to put away the way we feel. We have to put away what is around us, knowing that God is a bigger reality than that. There's an old hymn. It says, stand up, stand up for Jesus. Ye soldiers of the cross. Lift up the mighty banner. It shall not suffer loss. And then this hymn writer quotes Jeremiah 17. He says, stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. And then he says, put on the gospel armor. Each piece put on with prayer. Where duty calls or danger, be never wanting there. In other words, don't run away from the battle this morning. Don't run away from the hardships this morning. Don't flee when the enemy comes knocking. Because I like the, the, the rest of the hymn over here. He says, stand up, stand up for Jesus. The strife will not be long. You excited for that? I'm excited for that. The strife will not be long. The day, the noise of battle. The next, the victor's song. To those who vanquish evil, a crown of life shall be. They, with the king of glory, shall reign eternally. You see, we worship from a place of victory. No matter what we feel. Because we have a God who's made promises. He says, you will see my victory. You dare not trust in the flesh of man. You dare not trust and put your trust in things that will fail you. Church, before we end our time of worship, can we surrender those things that we've been trusting in? And say, Lord, once again, please point my heart to you, the God who will never leave me, who will never forsake me. A common lie that we've come to believe as Christians in this world is if you're not happy, there's something wrong. No. It's okay to go through seasons of sorrow. But don't you dare trust in the arm of flesh. It will fail you. Let me pray for you. If this is you this morning and you're struggling with this, please receive. Receive healing this morning. Receive encouragement from the throne room of grace this morning. As you repent, renounce the arm of flesh. Renounce your trust in man and say, Lord, I will trust you. And even though my situation might not change this morning, turn the sorrow into joy knowing that I put my trust in a God who makes promises and who will keep promises. And because of that, I know I will see a victory for the battle belongs to the Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your promises. We thank you, Lord, for your beautiful word that points us once again in the right direction. I pray that you'll do that right now, O oh Lord, in your presence. 
point our hearts once again towards your throne room of grace where we can run in with boldness in times of need. And now, O oh Lord, we surrender this next hour into your hands. Speak to us. Heal us. Redeem us, O oh Lord. Infuse us with boldness in the thick of the battle. Help us to vanquish the evil one and look forward to the next thing that's on the calendar, the victor's song with our eternal king. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. If you're not excited, you should be, okay? Because God wants to do a great work in your life this morning. So greet someone next to you. Say you're happy to see them, but good. Don't be lying. Thank you. Thank you, Spirit of Adam. Thank you. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. How many of you guys remember that hymn, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus? Good, good. Man, at some point in our series of worship, maybe we'll do one worship session with just hymns, huh? Um, that would be great, yeah. We'll call it songs that my mama used to sing. I'm joking, I'm joking. I used to sing them too, thank you. Um, there are times in worship when nothing cuts it, man, you know, and I love songs that actually sing Scripture uh, because some Scripture has a way, it's God's living, authentic Word that brings you back to where you need to be. And it, it challenges you in areas where you've, you've been living, and it calls you back to the real reality, which is God's presence. Before I jump into announcements, what are some of your favorite hymns? Let's shout it out. Okay, not like popcorn, one at a time. No. Sorry, what was that? Amazing Grace, of course. Yeah. How many of you guys are offended by that line, saved a wretch like me? I've heard of people who've been offended by that line. I'm not a wretch. Okay. What was the other hymn? <laughs> oh, good. It is well. Yeah, that's a beautiful hymn too. Until modern worship leaders butcher that hymn completely, huh? How many of you guys hate that when people take good old hymns and then just completely ruin it, right? Like, that doesn't need another chorus, bro. Put it away, man. Write your own songs. Anyways, I'm not just trying to kill time. I'm trying to get you guys to loosen up a little bit because message this morning is going to be hard. A okay. um, few quick announcements and we'll jump into the Word. This week, uh, I hope you've been praying for those that got baptized last Sunday. Seven of them. Beautiful. The church should be rejoicing. Good. Good. That's a beautiful thing. Um, we're living in a time in America where if it's not in the hundreds, no one's excited. One of the first questions people ask me is, how big is your church? I'm like, bro, Really? Really? We're playing those games still? You know? It's kind of crazy. It's like we judge people based on the weighing scale, based on the size of your church, based on the size of your bank account, based on the size of the square footage of your house. It's so crazy, man, when you get blinded by the arm of flesh that will fail you. Um, seven people got baptized. One of the best things that happened to me this week was remembering the testimonies of what God has been doing in these seven individuals' lives. If you were there last Sunday, um, a lot of those people that got, you know, each and every one of them that got in the waters of baptism has such a unique testimony, and if you see them, you should try to talk to them and get to know them. Uh, but don't be weird, uh, you know, and don't creep them out. They're new believers, some of them, so don't drive them away from the church by praying in old hymns. Okay. Um, that is something we love to celebrate in this church, new birth. We love celebrating new commitments being made when people give their life to Jesus. Um, this church is not a pop-up church. Once again, in this country, I don't think we are familiar with what a church plant looks like. Okay, we, we used to church transplants where someone comes with 100 people and plant a church. That's not a church plant. When you have a huge organization with all the money and resources that sends 100 people... And most, most of the time in churches, that drives me nuts, is we have people jumping from one church to another because they're offended. That's a church transplant, okay? I really want to celebrate this organic, slow growth, okay, of 
unbelievers finding new life in Jesus, giving their life to Jesus, and are being discipled, and it takes time. Okay, if you want to grow deep, it takes a lot of time. And, and this has been something that I'm super excited about with these seven people giving their life to Jesus and watching them and praying for them and seeing how God is going to change the trajectory of their life. So if you call yourself a part of the Living Church Boise, I want you to make it a priority to pray for these people because we don't want to be a church that entertains the goats like Charles Spurgeon would say, but we want to be people who feed the sheep, man, that God has brought into this fold and care for them. Amen? Amen. Good, good. Um, also, if you call yourself a part of the Living Church, Boise, support the church. The offering boxes are by the doors, and uh, you can also give online. Multiple ways to give. Um, the people watching us online, I'm so glad you're able to join us again this week, and uh, I'm hoping that God will bless you. And if you want to be a part of the Living Church Global, you can also participate in giving in uh, multiple different ways that you can give online. And I want you to know, each and every one of you that believes in what God is doing over here, I thank God for you. Um, you guys who have caught on to what God is doing over here and letting the Holy Spirit fill your sails and move you, uh, it blesses me, man. It blesses me immensely. And I'm really excited for what God has in store for us as a church. But I want you to be excited for what God has in store for you this morning from God's Word. Are you ready? Yes. All right. All right. So I know I'm not the only one. I know that there are many in church who come and participate in a time of worship, but don't really engage. It's hard for us to engage sometimes. Why do we sing during worship? By the way, we're doing a 10-week series on worship, and um, we're calling it the heart of worship. We're trying to reclaim worship in the church and kind of reject culture that's influenced our worship. And one of the things that's really influenced our churches is the music. Isn't it? Uh, in fact, statistics say that people go to churches, people crowd and fill up churches because of the worship, and then they stay for the preaching. Okay? So people, first of all, try to find churches where the worship is, you know, whatever it is, loud, powerful, man, meaningful, top rated, top 10 songs, you know, always all the hits, fantastic musicians. Now, I'm not against that. Okay? Great. Good for you. But I want to dive into the question of why do we sing? Why, why do we sing in worship? Now, you can say, you know, I'm very tempted to kind of, you know, let my pride build me up and go sit down with a couple of worship pastors and do a podcast with them and be like, why do you sing in worship? And see how they stutter and stammer. You know, it's my job, man. I get paid to do that. Okay? Uh, why do you sing? What's the history? Where did it all begin? You ever wondered that? Why do, why do we do church this way? Now, at some point in the series, I would love to do like a lecture on the history of how the church came to be the way it is today and how singing is a big part of church today. But I want to pose a question to you this morning before I start unpacking the messages. Why do we sing in worship? And, and why is it that we rely on worship leaders to lead us in singing? Why is it that you have to be a parrot singing words that somebody else wrote somewhere in Nashville, Tennessee? Okay, because he has a record label and he has to write 15 songs every month, otherwise he won't get paid, and one of them hits the radio and we all follow through and we're like, wow, that's great. Not knowing who this person is, where it's coming from, what their testimony is, does it aggravate you that it's possible that you're singing songs that have not come from a place of spirit filled, but just words that just rhyme and it has a good tune to it and it sounds good and so we keep singing? No, am I the only one? that gets so anal about it and be like, hey, what in the world's going on? What's the story behind the song? Because there are some songs that give me a nightmare that we sing in our churches. Buy me coffee sometime, I'll tell you some of them. It drives me nuts. It's not biblical at all. I'm not going to go off on a rant on that. Here's the point. Here's the point. God wants us to come into his presence with singing. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Some of you can't sing, but you can make a noise. God loves it. Don't worry. Okay? <laughs> Come with music. Come with instruments, with stringed instruments, with wind instruments, with, you know, cymbals and harps and all those things. God says, Come into my presence with joy and thanksgiving, making noise, making music. Yes, God wants us to sing to Him. But does it mean that we have to depend on people in Nashville for us to be able to sing? 
No, no, we don't. Now, you might not be a songwriter, but you know what? You write songs. You might not be a poet, but you write. And what I want to unpack to you this morning is how you and I, every single day of our lives, we write songs. It might not rhyme, it might not have a tune, but you're a songwriter. And there's a fair chance that your songs that you're writing, are you ready for this? There's a fair chance the songs you're writing is not pointed towards God, but it's pointed towards idols that you made in your life. And it's possible you even call those idols good Christian values, church. You call those, you know, idols, even you named it Jesus, but it's not the Jesus the Bible talks about. And we're going to be talking about the songs that you and I write. I'm going to take you through a, a very small chapter in the life of a man named Jacob. And we're going to see the songs that he sings, the songs that he's written as he goes through the battles in his life. And my hope is that by the end of this message, man, you will recognize the songs in your life and you will fight a victorious fight in redeeming those songs and pointing them back to God so that you will not be dependent on songwriters for you to be able to worship with a joyful noise. You excited for that? I hope you are, man. I hope you are. I've been praying that God will give you a capacity to be able to digest what we have this morning. I'm really excited for this message. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 29. If you have your Bibles, you can turn over there. Genesis 29, uh, we're going to be meeting a man named Jacob. And I'm going to point out three things from this few verses, from verse 15 to 35. And from these three things, a few sub points that I want you to glean from and for you to get your song back. I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's Word. We stand... When we read God's word, because, I mean, you like it when people stand when the national anthem is sung, because we have reverence, we have respect, uh, we, we want to recognize the blessing that we have, and we want to honor those who have given their life for you to have your freedom. Quite similarly, we stand when we read God's word, because we have reverence for what God has done for us. We respect and we recognize that we have a blessing when we read God's word. We wanted to speak to our heart. We wanted to change us. We wanted to begin to move us. Even before this preacher starts unpacking this passage, we want the Holy Spirit to show you that you can glean from God's Word even as it's being read. That's where we stand in the presence of God. We're going to be reading from Genesis 29, picking up from verse 15. Are you ready? Good. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you're my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel. And he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days. Why? Because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening, hmm, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban also gave his female servant Zilpha to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And in the morning... Behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, It is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we'll give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. So Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave also his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and served Laban for another seven years. Verse 31, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. 
She conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me the son also. And she called his name Simeon. Again she conceived and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will be attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name was called Levi. Verse 35 says, And she conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Yehuda, Judah. Then she ceased bearing. I'm titling this message, Get Your Song Back. Get your song back. Get your song back. I want to point out in these few verses that we read, the song of insecurity, the song of your history, and the song of surrender. Every single one of us are songwriters. Every single one of us are writing songs pointed in directions that need to be redeemed, pointed towards people that we shouldn't have in our life, pointed towards emotions and energies that shouldn't be expended in that direction. And this morning, your jealous God who loves you, who has a plan and a purpose for you, wants to redeem you and say, do not put your trust in the arm of flesh. It will fail you. Recognize the songs that you've been singing to false idols and get your song back. Let's pray and we'll get to work. Father, standing in your presence, I pray now that you'll help us understand your word, help us recognize your heart, Help us to recognize our hearts. Help us to recognize the songs that we've been singing. Give us divine wisdom now and insight. And point our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth. And to worship you and you alone. In Jesus' name. And the church said? Amen. Good. Please be seated. Thank you. All right. So you guys are getting it so far, right? You know where we're going this morning. Okay, because I was wondering if this message was going to go over some people's heads. But then I remembered that the Living Church, Boise, you guys like good teaching, don't you? Yes. Good, and that's what I'm here to deliver, man. Because God, He'll give me the insight, and I'll do the best I can to not let my accent butcher it, okay? Number one, let's look at this, the song of insecurity. You right away can pick up Jacob's insecurity over here if you knew what was happening before he comes to see Laban. You and I, you were not born insecure. You look at a baby, a baby doesn't care about its double chin. Okay? <laughs> In fact, I think if a baby could care, the baby would like it that it has a double chin because it makes all your old ladies go and pinch it, right? Yeah, it's fantastic. All a baby needs, man, I mean, even as a baby grows, the baby's fine with, you know, having a bottle instead of its mom just to be able to sleep, having its blanket and its little teddy bear. But eventually the baby does grow up, thankfully. Right? Maybe you guys are not like 35 years old still. I need my binky. Okay. Eventually a baby grows up and a baby does not need its blanket and its teddy bear and its bottle anymore. But now the baby is a young man who finds a security in a relationship, in a boyfriend, in a girlfriend, in a job, in which school he goes to, in um, what car he drives or she drives. And then eventually you grow up and then you want to have a house in a good neighborhood, uh, a good wife and everything that country songs talk about. And all our security now is in something else. We're not born with insecurities, but the world will chip away at all that you are and will make you feel like you need these things for you to fit in. You need these things for you to actually be somebody in this world. Jacob... He's just finished cheating his brother, Esau. Jacob's dad, Isaac, was getting old, and he wanted to bless his children. And so he tells Esau, his oldest son, he says, Hey, go into the field, hunt me something tasty, and bring it to me, and I will eat it, and I will bless you. Rebecca, Isaac's wife, Jacob's mother, hears this, and she loved Jacob. And she called Jacob, she says, Hey, come here. She said, This is what your dad wants to do. So I'll cook the meal just the way your dad likes it, and the goat's skin, I'll put it on your arm so that you'll feel like your brother Esau because Jacob is losing his eyesight. He cannot see well, but if he feels you, he'll think that you're Esau. Can you imagine how hairy Esau was? Some of you women who worry about your husband being too hairy, you have no idea. <laughs> this boy felt like a goat, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Greatest of all time, goat. Um, and Jacob also wears Esau's clothes so he can smell like Esau. It says that he smelled like the field. 
And um, he goes, he cons his dad, and he gets the blessing that should have been Esau's. Esau wants to kill Jacob for right reasons. And his mother finds out that I don't want to lose my boy Jacob. And so she calls Jacob and says, listen, man, you better flee. You go from Beersheba, 500 miles, all the way to this place called Padan Aram. And there my brother is there. You go stay with him for a few days. And when things settle down, I'll send word for you and you can come back. Here's a boy who loved his mother. He loved spending time with his mother. And his mother says, I don't want to lose you, man. Can you imagine a mother saying, I don't want to lose my child? And she says, to save your life, why don't you go 500 miles and I'll call for you when things settle down. Do you know what's going to happen? Here's a boy who's never left his home. He loved hanging out in the kitchen. He loved spending time with his mom. He goes to Padan Aram. He's going to be there for 20 years. Let your heart sink. A boy who loved staying with his mother, loved being with his mother every single moment he wanted to spend with his mother. His mother loves him so much that she's willing to lie, steal the blessings for his sake. He goes away. He's not going to see his mother again, folks. He's not going to see his dad again. They're all going to die while he's gone. And he's on the run. And he comes over here to Padan Aram. He's missing his mom. He's all alone, 500 miles traveling alone. That's a dangerous journey. And he finds his security in the eyes of a beauty queen named Rachel. He sees her eyes and it's like, it reminds me of my mother's eyes. Isn't it true that guys will somehow, you know, reflect the relationship that they have with their mom, somehow, whether good or bad, in the relationships that they have with their spouse or their girlfriends as they grow up. I've seen this to be true in, in almost every single person that I met. When I get to know their history, you get to see those traces in their life. But let's look at this. Jacob, very first moment he saw Rachel, he's like, man, this is what I need to replace the security that I've lost. You're tracking with me. This is what I needed. This is what I wanted. This is what made me feel like a man, that made me feel like I am secure. My mother's got my back. If I'm ever in danger, she will protect me. She will tell me, hey, run for your life. This is how you can get a blessing. But now she's not there. And he looks at Rachel and he says, you remind me of my mom. You remind me of security. You remind me of my blanket and my bottle and my teddy bear. I need this in my life. And so what's the first thing you guys do when you like a girl? You try to impress the girl's dad. At least that's what you should try to do. More than that, try to impress the mother-in-law if you're in America. It goes a long way, trust me. Genesis 29, verse 15, Then Laban said to Jacob, that's Rachel's dad, Because you're my kinsman, should you therefore sell me for nothing? Hey, listen, man, you are doing a great job over here, and I don't want you to work for me for free. I don't want you to, you, you, you're being a huge blessing to me. Tell me what shall your wages be? And, and it's almost like, now the, the, the writer is giving us a little bit of a backstory over here, talking about Laban and his two daughters, but Jacob's response is almost like he cuts off Laban. Let me know what your wages are. He's like, one word, Rachel. Can you picture that? Let me know, what, 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 what should your wage? Rachel, that's it. It's like Stanley in the office. What should we do to keep your money? No, money, money. That's Jacob's song. Rachel, Rachel, that's it. Nothing else, Rachel. But the narrator, let's read. We're not enough in the narrator. He wants you to know what's going on behind the scenes. Now, Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah. And the name of the younger was Rachel. So I want you to get that. The older is Leah, the younger is Rachel. It's important. Leah's eyes were weak. The narrator does not say that she was blind. He doesn't say that she, didn't, she couldn't see well. It's just that people who saw her did not want, want to keep seeing her. Okay? Now, if you think that the Bible is being very petty, calm down and get off your high horse. Okay? In today's world, we still judge people based on their appearance. Uh, we don't have to remind each other about racism not too long ago, but we judge people because of their appearance. There's still a lot of different forms of racism around the world, not just in America, based on appearance. So let's not look at the Bible and say, oh man, shame, shame, shame. Listen, we all are wretched, okay? Leah was ugly. Now, pause real quick. <laughs> pause, sorry. I have... <laughs> I just said, get off your high horse. Come on, man. <laughs> I have a niece named Leah. I love her. She's pretty. The day she was born, uh, I cried. My, my oldest brother, and this was his first, I mean, I was, that was the first time I became an uncle, man. It was such an amazing thing. I love this little girl. 
I hope that she'll come to America someday and you guys will get to meet her because she's extremely talented, very sweet, very humble. And while I was preparing for this, I want to make sure that if your name is Leah, <laughs> this does not reflect who you are, okay? No, this is what her name was. And they named her Leah. I don't know why. I looked into the Hebrew, but I'm not going to get into this. <laughs> it could have implications to deer, like a gazelle, and I wonder if she had that deer in the eye look, you know, deer in the lights, what do you call that? You know, it's like deer in the headlights, there we go. But her eyes were weak. But on the other hand, Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Hey, 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 we're going to talk about Leah, but, but let's, not, let's not skip past this too quickly now. Imagine growing up under the shadow of your younger sister who is flat out gorgeous and you have deer in the headlights look all the time. And imagine her upbringing. Imagine her dreams, her aspirations, man. We'll talk about her insecurity, but I don't want to miss Jacob's insecurity of him being loved by his mother and not having his mother by his side. And now he's desperate for somebody else to fill that void. Desperate. He's willing to do anything. And the worst part is he's showing his cards to a guy named Laban, man. Laban is a crook. Okay? Jacob loved Rachel, verse 18, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Now, is Jacob being very clear? Yes. Seven years for the youngest daughter, Rachel. He's naming it, he's claiming it, okay? He's praying it and he's praying it. <laughs> what do you want to call it, okay? He's like, it's mine. <laughs> seven years I'll give you. Jacob is being very clear, man. Very, very clear. I will work for you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Look at Laban's response. The snake in the grass here, man. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. Hmm. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. If you go past this too quickly, you will miss it. Okay? You need divine discernment to understand this. Laban is a crook. He's not saying, I will give you Rachel. Look at this. Hmm. You know, it's better that she's actually with you than with any other man. You know what? Stay with me. Jacob is so in love, so fueled with this need to, you know, find his security because he's lost it so quickly, like a wisdom tooth that's been pulled and he doesn't want to get a dry socket, so to speak. Ouch. I got to fill this void. Seven years I'll work for you. Big deal. Let's go. He's not really looking at Laban is like, yeah, you know what? It's better that I give her to you than anybody else. Yeah, you stay with me. Stay with me. Not like, okay, let's shake on it. Let's sign on it. Rachel will be yours in the end of seven years. That's not what he's saying. It's going to come back to haunt him later. Sly, sly man that he is. But look at this, verse 20. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed to him but a few days. Why? Because the love he had for her. If he was a cartoon, he'd have his eyeballs will be in a heart shape and be flying up every time she came by him. Right? Like the country song, The Farmer's Daughter. Seen that? Yeah. Makes the days go by so quickly, the sun doesn't feel hot. Why? Because the farmer's daughter, quite literally over here. That song is divine. We should sing it in church. I'm kidding. <laughs> now, let's bring it to where you are. Is it wrong to be in love? No. Is it wrong to fall head over heels in love with someone? Not at all, man. Not at all. No. Love is a good thing. It's good for you to be in love. It's good for you to want to be in a relationship. Listen to me. We're going, we're going to bring it to where you are now. Nothing wrong with you wanting to find someone that you can feel a sense of satisfaction. But when you're chasing after security without recognizing your insecurity, you know what you do? You create idols for yourself. Because there's only one who can actually save you from your insecurity, and that's the God who made you. Now, there are other things that he's put in your life for you to enjoy this life. But when you're chasing after security without going to God, for Him to be your primary security, we start off this morning with trusting in the arm of flesh. It will do what? It'll fail you. It'll fail you. Now, it doesn't seem like Rachel is the one failing him, but the enemy knows your insecurity, and he will find someone like Laban for you to experience defeat. Far too many times I've seen people in this very area of love in this very area of relationships, trying to find security, having to wrestle with the Labans in their life because they don't realize 
the insecurity in their life. They're not getting real with the insecurity that they are trying to fill, the void they're trying to fill. And there's only one who can fill those voids. His name is Jesus. And through him, you'll be able to enjoy the freedom of relationships, the freedom of falling in love and getting married and all those things. When you do not get real with your insecurities, but you're driven by it, you will make gods out for yourself that will let you down. Okay, it's not going to be up on the slides, but please write this down. Please write this down. If, because you're not going to, you might not get it while you're sitting here because it feels like you're drinking from a fire hydrant, but I want you to write this down. When you do not get real with your insecurities, but you're driven by it, you will make gods out for yourself that will let you down. You want to underline that. They will absolutely let you down. Do you know that in our country today, even among Christians, people have more gods than joy? We have more gods that we're running after, trying to fill our insecurities, than we have joy, which proves to you that your gods that you worship don't really fulfill your desires that you're chasing after. God, help us, save us, get real with your insecurities. How do you do that? You take it to God. You take it to God. You sit in this prayer and say, Lord, why, why, why am I chasing after this? You see, your insecurity might not be Rachel. Your insecurity might be money. It might be friends. It might be community. Almost every week we get prayer requests from people who are heartbroken. My friends left me. My friends don't invite me. Hey, listen, at some point you got to get real and say, okay, wait a minute, man. Why do I even want friends? I'm not saying be a loner. I'm not saying be single for the rest of your life. But you got to get real with, why are you chasing after these things? This morning, I was fighting with God about my own insecurity. Why do I want to be a pastor? Why do I want to be a preacher? Why do I want to preach this series? And I'm so glad that God pointed out insecurities in my life that makes me not rely on you. Praise God for that because you're not my God. How terrible it is when I start relying on how many people show up to church. That becomes my God. And many times in church, we don't realize, in Christianity, we don't realize how many gods we've created for ourselves. How many of you guys, your worry goes away when you see your, 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 you know, your paycheck increase? Now, I know there is some satisfaction in having enough money to pay your bills, but is it possible that it's become a God? The arm of flesh will fail you. You have to take your insecurities to God. Let me illustrate this with, illustrate this with you with what happens with Jesus. Satan shows up after Jesus had fought, fasted for 40 days, and he tries really hard to find an insecurity in Jesus. 40 days Jesus has been fasting, and the first thing Satan comes and says, hey, listen, you're hungry. Turn these stones to bread. Find your security in food that fills your belly. We don't talk about that in church, do we? How much we work hard for food that perishes? Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out from God's own mouth. And immediately Satan doesn't give up. He says, hey, listen, how about recognition? You bow down, you worship me, and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus rebukes him again and says, you should not worship anybody else but God, the first and foremost commandment. And then he says, listen, how about you put God to the test? Jump off the temple and everybody will see that, wow, angels come and gather you and you'll become someone famous. How about fame and power and knowing for certain that God is for you? And Jesus says, get behind me, man rebukes him, throws him out of his life. Satan could not find one ounce of insecurity in Jesus' life because Jesus found he was fully secure. In fact, in the book of John, it says that knowing where he had come from and knowing where he was going, he gets up, he takes up his outer garments and dresses up as a servant and washes the feet of his disciples. Talk about being secure in who he was. Take your insecurities to God, please. Because if you don't, the songs of insecurity will bring Laban's out of the woodwork that will enslave you. If you're not familiar with the songs of insecurity, get very familiar with it. Because a lot of times, your insecurities are actually good things that the enemy has misdirected you on. Like I said, love is a good thing. Marriage is a good thing. Children is a good thing. Getting a good job is a good thing. Being a fantastic leader is a good thing. Being a great pastor is a good thing. Being a missionary is a great thing. But make sure it's not being fueled by insecurity. You're with me this morning. Good. Don't let your appetite for security cause you to give away your life as worship to the taskmasters of this world because Satan, he is prowling 
around like a lion, seeing whom he can devour. He's looking for any area of insecurity, and he's waiting for you to sing your song of insecurity for him to take control over you. While Satan, like Laban, promises you the love of your life, he's only fixing to remind you of your dark past that you're trying to get away from. Number two, the song of your past. You might even want to write this down as the song of your slavery. The song of your slavery. You see, don't forget Jacob. He's running away from his home, trying to get away from his guilt, trying to get away from being a thief, trying to get away from his identity of being a tripper, a crook, a thief. That's what his name means. Jacob has run 500 miles, but his guilt is still going to follow him. I wonder how many of you sitting over here in the presence of God is struggling with this very same thing. What happened when you were 18 years old? What happened when you were in your first marriage? What you did that one time, the enemy is still singing those songs over you. You've got to recognize the song of your slavery, the song of your past that the enemy keeps singing over you, like what Laban does. Look at this verse 21. Jacob said to Laban, after the end of seven years, give me my wife that I may go into her for my time is completed. I had to make a note to myself not to make any jokes over here because I will get into trouble. <laughs> See my straight face? No humor on this side, okay? But, but rabbis over the years, they've tried very hard to try to explain the brash boldness of the statement. Nobody goes to their future father-in-law and be like, hey man, seven years, I'm... I'm desperate now. Come on, let's go. Let's do this thing. Get the party on the road. You know? That's exactly what he's saying, man. You could tell, like, this boy is, he's desperate. Do you see that? Should we read it again? Verse 21. Give me my wife that I may go into her for my time is complete. Come on! <laughs> chip, chop, chip, Laban. Let's go. So Laban, he hurried up. He gathered all the people together of that place and made a feast. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah. In case you missed it, that's not Rachel, that's Leah. And brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And verse 25 says, And in the morning, I like how ESV writes it, Behold, it was Leah. Pause right there. No matter what satisfaction you're trying to find in this life, no matter what comfort you're trying to find to ease and appease your insecurity, if you don't get real with your insecurity, you will wake up with someone in your bed wondering what in the world happened last night. Can I get a witness? <laughs> this is true, man. Hey, you can go 20 years, and all of a sudden, you're like, what in the world? What have I been doing? What is this? Deer in the headlights in my bed. That's not what I wanted. I had my eyes on Rachel. Sorry, if your name is Leah, I love you, and I'm sure you're a beautiful, beautiful person. I'm talking about this Leah in the book of Genesis. Behold, it was Leah. How many of you guys this morning, I'm not talking about your spouses. I'm talking about your life now, metaphorically. You look at your life, and you're like, what is Leah doing in my life? What is this Sorry, again, I'm not mean, don't mean to be insulting. I'm not talking about a person now. I'm talking about things in your life. What is this ugly, disgusting thing doing in my life? What is this addiction doing in my life? I didn't sign up for this. This is not what I worked hard for. This is not why I traveled 500 miles, set my eyes on, sung songs, cried, waited for, worked in the sun for, not this. Get this, please. Behold, it was Leah. Why? Because Satan, like Laban, will promise but will always under-deliver. Dear God, man. I can, this, this is, this is mind-blowing, eye-opening stuff. Because when you look at your life, you're going to recognize the ugliness that your songs of insecurity has dragged in. The ugliness, the disgusting things that you cannot cut away from your life now. It's there to stay, man. Oh, it feels like, now nah, I got to have babies with this. Ugh. Behold, it was Leah. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I'm going to say something a little extreme. Are you okay with that? Every single insecurity has to be taken to God. Every single one of them. God, I sneeze funny. Please help me. God, I walk funny. Please help me. God, I don't look like everybody else in my neighborhood. Please help me. Now, that seems very extreme. It seems like, really, man? Like, are you stupid? Yes, I am. That's why I need God. I am super insecure. I need God to be my security. God, I have weird taste in music. Please help me. God, I look like I should like hip-hop, but I really like country. Please help me. God, I look like I should be a drug dealer, and that's why cops pulled me over, but you called me to be a pastor. Please help me. You think I'm joking. That is an insecurity of mine. Why? Why? Why should you take every insecurity to God? Because you're finding a security in everything else, man. Laban's will come out of the woodwork, and you'll be surprised how the enemy will use them in the tiniest little thing. Tiniest little thing. Oh, you have a gray hair on your beard. Mm, 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 mm. You're old now. You better start slowing down. You can't be doing those things like you're a young whippersnapper. You know what I'm talking about? The lies that you believe? I'm preaching this message from a place where I've cried many nights in loneliness and insecurities. I'm preaching this message because I've seen the light. I've seen the freedom that God can bring. I've been in the place where relationships was my identity. If I wasn't in a relationship, I did not know who I was. And I recognize this because I didn't have a relationship with my parents. So I was grabbing, just like Jacob. How am I able to see these things? Because I see it in my own life, man. And if you want to humble yourself, you will see it too. And not just see it, but you will find the freedom when you get extreme. Every insecurity, Lord, help me. If you see me walking around, this is, he says, Lord, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, God, help me, please help me, please help me, please help me. And some people are like, what do you need help with? I'm like, dude, I don't know. I'm dying. Help me, God. Please help me. Please help me. I look at my children. Please help me, God. I have five of them. Pray for me. One of the comments um, from last week, I said this in passing. I said, as believers, your life should be as a man who's been crucified or a woman crucified. On the cross, you're not worried about how you appear. On the cross, you're not worried about what your next meal is going to be. On the cross, you're not worried about if your lawn is going to die this summer and if it's going to last through winter. On the cross, those worries fade away. On the cross, your just next breath is, give me Jesus. I'm excited to see him. Just give me Jesus. I want to be ready for eternity. And one person commented on this clip and said, oh, please, let's get real. So I decided that we'll get real this morning, okay? So I brought some statistics with me because we're going to get real, right? And people want to get real, so let's get real. Okay, so here we go. Let's get real. Six in seven people worldwide, not just in America, not just in Boise, not just among white folks, black folks, brown folks, six in seven people worldwide, so no matter where you're listening to me, this includes you, six in seven people worldwide are plagued, not struggled with, not dabble with, but are plagued with feelings of insecurity. This is a very recent study, by the way. This is not something done in the 70s when they didn't have medication. Plagued with insecurity. Six out of seven people, and I think the seventh person is lying. <laughs> Why is it that in church we just like to skirt around our insecurities and put it away and say, you know, it's okay, we'll just come sing, I'm going to see a victory, when you go back home to absolute defeat. Six out of seven people. So let's get real with that. And I want to get real with this and say, okay, so we do struggle with insecurities. And if you don't get real with the insecurities, you have Laban showing up in your life. And most of you are married to that Laban. Most of you have those children that have grown up to be Laban. Your bosses are the Laban. Your presidents are Labans. It's eating away at your insecurity. Look at, look at, look at the nation right now, man. Please, look at the nation right now. We can't trust doctors. We can't trust news media anymore. We can't trust politicians and leaders of your nation. How in the world can people feel secure in a country like that? Yes, this is a reality. You want to talk about reality? I'm bringing reality. My God is real. And then he says, the word of God, seek first the... And all these things will be... Yeah. 
You seek first the kingdom, all these things will be added to you. But you know what happens? Because of a lack of faith, when someone actually does that and God begins to bless, we're like, charlatan, thief, hypocrite, look at him. If he has so much money, he's a crook, he's a liar. Stop that! God's word is true. He who the Son sets free is what? So when I take my insecurities to him, I get real with it. Now, as we're going to see, your situation might not change. Get this? Your situation might not change. Okay? But your security will 110% change. You see, my insecurities don't change. I still speak with an accent, bro. Thank you. Some people need subtitles, but that's fine. I love them too. My insecurities are still there. My personality doesn't change. My leadership style doesn't change. My drive, my passion doesn't change. Even if I try to preach in just a calm, soothing voice, it uh, doesn't happen. And people are like, it's too loud. You frighten my children. It's because you didn't spank him. No, I'm kidding. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. See, it's jokes like this that get me into trouble. But when I take my insecurity to God, when I take my insecurity to God, he says, hey, don't worry, man, don't worry. I love you. You're weird, but I love you. I'm like, good. It's nice to know that I'm loved. Let's bring it back to Jacob before I get into more trouble. <laughs> Jacob, thoroughly fooled. Thoroughly fooled. I wonder how many of you guys feel fooled this morning. Mm, I'm sorry. I know your heart's crying right now. You're like, that's me, man. That's me, man. That's me. I've been fooled by Satan's lies. That sounded so good. For me, it's been more than seven years. It's been all my life. And Laban, 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 look at him, look at him. Look at the song of slavery. Look at the song of slavery. Look at the song of your past that you need to be aware of. Laban said, it is not so done in our country to give the younger born before, or the younger before the firstborn. Now, I know you didn't get this. I'm going to read it again, and I'm going to emphasize what needs to be emphasized. Are you ready? So listen up. Jacob is saying, what have you done? You deceived me. Laban's answer, Jacob, it is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. It's not so done in our country where the younger gets the blessing of the older. Ouch. You hear it now? I know what you did. Founded miles back home. I know what you did with your older brother. I know what you did with the blessing that was supposed to be your older brother's blessing, and you stole it. But in our country, man, we, we don't do that. You see how quickly Jacob has to shut up when the song of slavery is sung over him. And I want to give you the answer of how to fight the song of slavery over you. And you're going to find breakthrough this morning in the presence of God. But look at, look at Jacob's response to this. He says, well, Laban says, complete the week of this one that's finished the honeymoon period of one week, poor Leah, and will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. How many of you guys, because the song of slavery of your past being sung over you, you're continuing in perpetual slavery? You think that, oh, this Christmas season is all going to come to an end. Oh, this relationship is going to bring it to an end. Oh, this new church is going to bring it to an end. Oh, this new pastor, this new sermon series is going to bring breakthrough. My friend, until you begin to hear the word of God, get real with your insecurities, and recognize the song of slavery, you're not going to come to a place of freedom. And what does Jacob do? Like a slave, Jacob did so. And he completed the week, that one week with Leah, and Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. And Laban also gave his female servant, Bila, to be his daughter, Rachel's servant. And so Jacob, he had honeymoon with Rachel that following week. And then it says, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. And he served Laban for another seven years. Now, you might be thinking over here and saying, see, pastor, it's not that bad. In the end, he did get the girl that he loves. And one on the side, too. So what? It's not that bad. Hmm, really? So first of all, he's a slave for seven years more to a liar, knowing that he's a liar. How many of you guys want to keep working for a liar? I don't want to work for a liar, man. And what you're going to see is Laban is going to take advantage of Jacob for 20 years. 
This is the truth about Satan. He's a liar. And everything he says is a lie. Everything he promises, he's not going to keep. Are you ready to break the cycle of slavery over your life? If you're going to get your song back, you have to recognize the song of slavery being sung over you, the song of your past sung over you. And this is how you break the cycle of slavery. Write this down, please. You ready? Run. Run from those who are using your past against you. Run. Run from those who are using your past. I don't care how much of a loss your business has to take. It doesn't matter how, much, how far you have to move. If there's a person who's not really there to see you succeed in holiness, in righteousness, flee. Run. Find a different church if you have to. Find a different neighborhood if you have to. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And sometimes you got to run away from his presence, man, because he's there just to keep you in a cycle of slavery. How long are you going to think that, you know what? This time it's going to be different. Every time I talk to people who've gone in and out of relationships, like fifth time, they're like, this one is going to be very different. He's not going to beat me this time. Really, man? Everything about him seems the same as the person you just left. He's just young and he's more richer. Run from those who are singing the song of slavery over you. How are you going to recognize the song of slavery? It's only when you begin to take your insecurities to God. Because every insecurity is a potential for you to be a slave of someone like Laban that Satan will use. I know for some of you it's not relationships, man. For some of you it's the lies that you keep telling yourself over and over and over again. You need to stop. You need to run from those lies. Sometimes it's easy if it's just people that you have to run away from, places you have to run away from, jobs you have to run away from. That's great. But what do you do when the lies are here? What do you do when the stories are being played over here, memories are over here? You have to stop that memory, stop that thought, stop that word, stop that song that keeps dragging you back to the past that you are not in anymore. In fact, that's what PTSD is, isn't it? It's the trauma of something that happened that's influencing your present that's going to ruin your future. How are you going to break free from this crazy cycle of slavery? Recognize your insecurity. Take it to God. Find your security in Him. And every single person that's trying to put a leash around your neck that's speaking good, kind words over you, but really wants to get you to be a slave for them, run. Here's another thing. There are people who will see your gifting, but will not respect your anointing, run. You know why I don't go preach many places, man? That's because people see the giftedness, but they don't want to respect my anointing. I don't have any respect for those people. If people are just respecting how I can talk, my oration, that's nothing. This is nothing. Even a donkey can speak. If God gives us the ability to speak, which he did in the Old Testament, how many people are using your gift but not recognizing your anointing? That's a Laban. How many people want your insight, want your hard work, want your youth, want your experience, but refuse to see the God-given anointing in your life? Now you could say, well, in the world people don't see the anointing. Trust me, they do. In fact, people recognize your anointing in the world more than they do in the church. Can I get an Amen. Yeah, it happens a lot. Please, take your insecurities to God. Find your security in Him. He will give you the discernment to know who's trying to put a leash around your neck. There were some of you that certain things were true in your past. Okay, I'm going to bring this point to a close, but I have to say this. Some of you, there were truths in your past, okay, that are not truths anymore. This is what I mean. When you were young, yeah, you were sleeping around. But now, that is not your identity anymore. That was a truth in the past. But now you're a child of God. you got to stop the songs of your past being sung over you, whether it's in your mind or whether it's by people who know you from the past. Some of you, you were a thief. You were a crook. You were a liar. Some of you, you did fail. Just last week you failed. But today God's giving you an opportunity to say, 
all the old is gone and behold, all things are becoming new. What do you want to be? Do you want to be the new creation or do you want the songs of slavery sung over you? This morning, God's giving you a chance to break free from the songs of Laban singing your past over you to bring you back into a cycle of slavery. Jacob should have said, man, you're playing me. You work me like a slave, but you lay back. Homie, don't play that. It's time for you to suffer the payback. It's time to attack, Jack. You got me trapped. That's actually lyrics from Tupac Shakur, trapped. I was right. I was like, hey, this actually goes really well. That's what Jacob should have said, the OG Tupac. The narrative switches from Jacob and Laban to Jacob and Leah. And folks, here's something, man, that's been very true. I've seen this. Hurt people will hurt people. Do you know that? Now, I know you don't want to be Laban in the story, do you? How many of you guys want to be there? I want to be Laban. I will, I'll sign up for that. That sounds great. Get rid of my ugly daughter and have someone work for me for 14 years? Yes. Yeah. No, we don't want to be Laban. But Jacob seems like he turns into a Laban kind of a character with Leah, man. And if you're not careful with your insecurities and you are okay with being abused in your slavery, you will become an abuser yourself. And that's not what God created you for. God created you for, you for you to be a person who brings His love, His light, His peace, His healing in a broken world. Not to be another Laban. We have too many Labans already. Let's look at this last point, number three. We see Leah's song of surrender. Everything that I preach to you is going to be illustrated through Leah. So if you think that I'm making this stuff up, you're going to see it right here in the way Leah walks through her insecurity her song of slavery, and then she doesn't stop there. She sings a song of surrender. Have you ever felt like you're minding your own business and one morning you wake up and you are the Leah? <laughs> no, no? I'm like, how in the world? I, I wouldn't have any eyes for Jacob. I didn't want this guy. I was happy for my sister. I was happy for my brother. And I wake up next to Jacob. Dude, I didn't want this. And now you are in the middle of a fight. You're being hated for no reason, right? I mean, the passage doesn't say anything that Leah had the hearts for Jacob or she was trying to compete with the sister in any way for Jacob's affection. She was living in insecurity and she kind of had found a groove. But she wakes up in the morning and Jacob is like, what is this? And he's going and picking a fight with the dad. Now, you might think, why didn't Leah protest? Why didn't Leah say, Jacob, time out before you do anything? I got to tell you, I'm not Rachel, I'm Leah. Why, why didn't Jacob know that it was Leah? Well, two things, okay? One, no electricity, okay? <laughs> and I think people were brown, darker than me maybe, and if I'm wearing something like this and I'm in a dark room, you probably won't see me until I smile, okay? And uh, no, but jokes aside, the bride would be veiled, and uh, it's possible that Jacob was drunk that night. They had a huge party. For the Baptist folks, I'm sure it was grape wine. Don't worry. Okay, because how can the father of our faith be drunk? Mm, yeah, it had a lot worse than that. But anyways, and why didn't Leah protest? Well, in its culture back then, man, and even now in many parts of the world, you don't talk back to your dad. I remember my dad telling me, like, dude, if I tell you to die, you die. Like, that's the kind of obedience that dads from that side of the world require from their children. So don't bring your Western cultural judgment into this and look at Leah and say, well, she, got this, she brought this on herself. A daughter would trust her dad until the dad puts a hand in the hand of her future husband and says, okay, now you will honor him and you will trust him and he will protect you with his life. Leah, I feel really sad for her. Although Jacob did not have the eyes for her, God's eyes was on her. Look at this in verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Verse 32 says, And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. Reuben means, look, a son. Pause real quick over there. Do you hear insecurity? In case you didn't catch it, culturally, it was a blessing for a couple to get married and then to have a son, because then the legacy is carried on. The family would not have to be watered down because a son will carry the legacy of the family. And Leah says, I am being a great wife to Jacob. Reuben, look, a son. Jacob, I know you don't have eyes for me, but look, 
I gave you a son. I'm, I'm being a blessing to you. How crazy is that? Hey, what's your son's name? Look a son. Sounds like a Chinese name. Look a son. No, it was Jewish. Reuben means look a son. And then she says, for now, my husband will love me. Do you see her insecurity? Because she's grown up all her life as a little girl saying, I'm never going to get married. No one's going to want me. I'm not going to have any children. But God has his eyes on her and he opens up a womb. That's not some ancient mumbo jumbo. It's God who blesses us with children. That's why children are a blessing from God. And she says, finally, my insecurity can be secure in my husband because I'm being a blessing, I'm contributing. Even though I'm not beautiful, I'm contributing a son. Look, a son. You're not going to forget that name now, right? Look, a son. Verse 33, she conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I'm hated. Oh, can you feel her pain, man? The Lord has heard that I'm hated. He has given me the son also. And she called his name Simeon. Simeon means I'm heard or I will be heard. She says, maybe now my husband will hear me. Now, finally, my husband will hear me. First, he's not really paying attention to me. But my first son, I thought he would love me. But he's not just listening to me. He's not giving me any attention. But maybe now, two sons. Wow. He'll hear me. But her insecurity is not calmed in any way. Verse 34 says, again she conceived and bore a son. Can I pause real quick? This is like those women who are like, my husband doesn't love me, but every nine months they're getting pregnant. Come on, get your story straight. What's happening over here? No, you don't find that funny. I thought it was funny. I'm like, Leah, if you kept emailing me for prayer requests every nine months saying my husband doesn't love me, but you're pregnant, I don't have a problem with that, okay? I'm like, let's talk about this. I think you're misunderstanding. There's a communication barrier over here. She's insecure, man. And she's like, hey, maybe if I give you another son, maybe now, this time, my husband will be attached to me. That's verse 34. Because I've borne him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi. But Levi doesn't always deliver. <laughs> Levi means to be attached. And she thinks that now, maybe my husband will be attached to me. Leah sounds like a, a perfect wife for the Baptist boys to find. I'll tell you why. You ready? <laughs> she's not very good looking, so no competition there. She's popping up babies like nobody's business. Okay? She's a homely woman. She's like, I want my husband's attention. Please give me attention. I don't know if, sorry, I shouldn't have gone there, but I just thought it was funny. I'm like, man, yeah, I could see a lot of Baptist friends that I have be like, she's a perfect wife, bro. Jacob doesn't like her at all. Jacob is upset that she's in his life. And you can tell by the names that she's giving her children. Reuben, look, a son, Jacob. Simeon, God has heard me. Maybe you will hear me. Levi, maybe now you'll be attached to me. But Jacob is attached to Leah. You see her insecurity. You see her song of slavery, constantly going back to her husband. <clears throat> you see, getting married is a good thing. Having a husband who loves you is a good thing. But it's very possible for you to use your marriage to fill the void that only God can fill, to use your children as a crutch for you to lean on, for you to find security in them. A lot of your children don't hang out with you anymore because you're trying to live your life through them. You're putting your fear over them of all your past failures. And they're like, Dad, back off, man. You need to find your security in God and give them into the hands of God. Poor Leah, she's using her children as a crutch to lean on to say, maybe somehow my husband will pay attention to me again. Some of my husband will love me again. Some of my husband will want to be attached to me again. Does it happen? No. You hear a song of insecurity. You hear a song of slavery. But now we hear the song of surrender that I want you and me to be able to come to a place of this morning. Verse 35, she conceived again and bore a son and said, this time, this time, I will do what? I will praise the Lord. This time I will praise the Lord. 
No more now my husband will love me. No more now he'll be attached to me. No more now he'll give me attention. This time, Jacob, you can do whatever you want, man. I am going to take my song back. <laughs> I'm taking my song back. I'm taking my life back. I'm taking my worship back. I'm not going to lean on you for me to find my security. I'm not going to lean on my children for me to find security. I am taking my life and my song back. This time, I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Yehuda, Judah. Then she ceased bearing. Until much later, she will bear more kids, which is a whole different story. But Judah, in Hebrew, Yehuda, Yod, He, Dalit, that's how you'd spell it in Hebrew. Yod always speaks of Yahweh God. The pictograph of Yod is an arm, the strong arm of the Lord. Those who trust in the arm of flesh, you will fail, but those who trust in the arm of the Lord, you will succeed. She puts her trust in the arm of the Lord. He is where we get the word hallelujah from, which means worship with your hands raised. And here's the beautiful part, Dalit, Ya. Ha, da, Dalit is a picture of a door. This is beautiful. This is why. She says, outside, what awaits me is only insecurities. Outside the doors, there's nothing for me in the world. Outside these doors, my husband doesn't love me. Outside these doors, my dad doesn't really care for me. Outside these doors, I'm just a competition to my sister. Outside these doors, even my children couldn't benefit me, but behind the doors, I will raise my hand to Yahweh, and I will praise Him. I will raise my hand, I will praise Him, I'm not going to let the world steal my song, I'm not going to let my husband steal my worship, I'm not going to let anybody become a crutch, I will raise my hand behind the closed doors, and I will worship. She recognizes her insecurity, she's lived under the impression that she'll never be loved, and it looks like there's a glimmer of hope when finally she's married, and then there's excitement when she has sons, and she sees that chasing after the world to fill a security will only leave her in that perpetual cycle of slavery until she comes to the place of saying, here's my song of surrender. Leah's situation does not change. Her looks don't change. Her appearance doesn't change. Jacob's love for Leah does not change. But you know what changes? The source of her security. What's going to get you to the song of surrender is when you come back to the source of your security. Get real with the insecurities. Take it to God. Recognize the song of slavery. Don't let the slaves continue to be slaving or be your slave master over you anymore. And then lift up your song of surrender. Lift up your song of surrender and let God become the source of your security. Judah. Judah. What happens to Judah? What happens to Judah, man? Judah is where he's going to have children and King David is going to be born. And it's from Judah that many generations later, a man named Yeshua, the Savior of the world, is going to come from Judah. Get this? Get this, please? Here's a woman who's unloved. Here's a woman who's ugly. Here's a woman who doesn't, who's not wanted by her husband. But she fights the insecurity, fights the slavery, says, I will sing my song of surrender, my song of praise. And here comes a Savior who battles every insecurity that you and I face. It's put on the cross, humiliated. He dies a victorious death, comes out victorious out of that empty grave so that you and I don't have to be slaves to our insecurity anymore. So that you and I can say, like Leah, man, I will raise my hand in worship. Even if it's behind closed doors, the world has nothing for me. Give me Jesus. In every breath, just give me Jesus. In my failure, give me Jesus. In my nights when I can't sleep, just give me Jesus. When I'm unloved, give me Jesus. When my relationships are falling apart, when my finances are falling apart, when the nation is falling apart, when my health is falling apart, when my age is falling apart, come back to your song of surrender. This is your final application. We'll pray and we'll close. As you go back home this morning and as you live every day in the presence of our King, I want you to recognize the songs of insecurity that's got a grip over you and rebuke it and fight it in the name of Jesus. Lift up, and this is how you do it. You lift up your insecurities to Him. You give it to Him as an offering. 
recognize the song of slavery around you that's trying to entrap you. Don't let the slaves in this world play you anymore. It was for freedom that Christ has set you free, no longer to be subject under a yoke of slavery. Are you ready for that freedom? Good. Would you please stand in freedom and we'll pray and we'll close. Leah, I want to challenge you again. Her situation did not change. Don't say, God changed my situation, then I will trust you. That is weak, pathetic faith. Do not do that. Why don't you be like Job, who says, Yea, though he slay me, yet will I praise him. Take the whole world, give me Jesus. That does not mean you have to be some weirdo man. Actually, when you live that life is when you're the realest person you can ever be. In this world today, we have AI. We have access to so much information. You know what we don't have access to? Authenticity. We don't have access to genuine people fighting a genuine fight. And in the church, let us not be those who don't have a genuine guard in our genuine fights. Lift up your genuine insecurities to him, man. Say, Lord, I want to come back to my song of surrender. I want to come back to praising Yahweh behind closed doors because the world has nothing for me. I don't care what the world thinks. I don't care what the world says. I'm not going to be leaning on my idols anymore. You see, Leah, everything that she wanted seems like such a great Christian wife. She wanted babies. She wanted the love of her husband. She has biblical names. But you see how many times even those Christian value things can become slavery for you and me? A crutch that we lean on? Your identity comes from relationships. Your identity comes from your children. Your identity comes from whatever it is, man. It might be a good thing, but those good things will quickly turn bad if it's there just to feed your insecurity. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the gift of joy that you've given us even in our seasons of darkness. And now, Lord, every single person that wants this freedom, I pray that it will be theirs. Every single person that wants to sing the song of freedom, that wants to sing the song of surrender, please, Lord, come and invade their lives like never before, like they've never experienced before, and let them have the touch from the true and the living God for them to recognize the insecurities and to watch you turn those insecurities as means of them finding you. Father, whatever it is that our eyes are attached to, our hearts are attached to, I pray now, O oh Lord, that you will detach us from the world. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, please cut away the ties from the world and let our hearts be bound once again just to you and your service. For those that do not know what the surrender looks like, this is what it is, man. It's you making a decision right now, saying, God, I'm going to take the first step. I'm going to take the first step now of recognizing my insecurities and my need for a Savior in whom I can find my security. That first step of getting real is admitting, God, I need you. I need you. I need you. Because there's only one person in this world who will never let you down. His name is Jesus. There are other people who love you, man. Yes, but the arm of flesh will fail you. Please, put your life into his nail-scarred hands. And your song does not have to rhyme. Your song does not have to have a tune. This is your song. Your song is your heart being squeezed and crushed. Your heart being squeezed and crushed. Don't let the world squeeze and crush your heart, man. Give your heart into the hands of a nail-scarred Savior whose word says that he will protect your mind and your heart with his hands. Why do you want to put your heart and your emotions into the world that will beat you up, that will lie to you, that will make promises that it cannot keep? So this morning, give your heart to Jesus and sing your song of surrender. Jesus, 
have all of our lives, Lord. Have every part of our lives. The good, the bad, the ugly, the self-righteous, the hypocritical, the, even the little desire of wanting to know you have it, Lord. Please, you do surgery in our life. You sift and clean and you spray the brake cleaner that removes all the grease so we can once again shine in your presence. Let's not serve another seven years to a taskmaster, Lord. Let the chains be broken this morning. Open our eyes to see the joy of freedom in your presence. We thank you. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the power of the Holy Spirit, <laughs> yes, break every chain over your life, break every lie over your mind, set you free in the presence of the living King, for you to live for him and have the courage to die for him. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Have a productive, victorious week.